Hey, come on, come out. Wherever you are, we need to have this meeting at this tree. Ain't even been planted yet. I open by blessing this space with this poem, calling on all silent minorities by activist, poet, and educator June Jordan, and the image of artwork by Dr. Grace Player, which was created for last year's conference, visualizing this poem. We need to have this meeting at this tree. I first give honor and praise to my ancestors and elders past and present. I acknowledge and ground myself in the memories and living will of the indigenous peoples and the history of the enslaved people who labored and survived so that I may be here. I thank my family and friends, many of them who are here in spirit, and I give special love and gratitude for my sister, Dietra Price Dennis, and a huge shout out to Dr. Cassie Brownell in the back for helping me get my slides together. And finally, such a beautiful sight, I thank all of you. At this meeting, at this tree, I want to share with you some of the reflections on the significance of four communities that have been central to my work, with youth and in school communities, within literacy teacher education, in research, and within the professional organization. I invite you to think with me about how we define and understand community, particularly to consider discourses that we engage for these understandings. Who and what is excluded, included? And as a literacy research community, who are we becoming and who do we want to be? Last year's conference theme was reclaiming literacy research, centering activism, community, and love. The theme came about because I was and remain deeply troubled by the ongoing incidents of racial violence in our communities and the persistent threats against the protection of immigrant youth and their families. I was angry at that time about, as I still am, about the zero tolerance policy of separating children and families at the U.S. southern border. I lived the reality of being a mother to a young black man in this country where despite all the love and hope that my partner and I pour into him, he is viewed and treated as public enemy number one. I was and am concerned with the current social and political climate and the particular ways that members of overlapping and intersecting oppressed communities, including indigenous people, people of color, women, gender nonconforming and transgender people, undocumented immigrants, and disabled body people have inspired the act of reclaiming time and power to fight against hatred and dehumanization, racial and gender injustices, and other acts of violence. I do not believe that these realities are peripheral to literacy research. I do believe that literacy research matters, and it has the potential to work against these social inequities, or it can further perpetuate harm and even be used against the people and communities that it purports to serve. So I hope that my talk this evening invites us to continue this necessary dialogue, to critically reflect on and answer questions about our relationships to and with communities, living in these times and the purpose and the impact of our work. In recent weeks, my university campus has been disrupted yet again with the terror of racial violence. I say again because the racial violence on my campus is not a distant memory in the 60s or the 70s. In November 2014, at the height of the Ferguson uprising and the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement and the continued killing of black bodies by the police state, a coalition of SU student groups, the general body, protesting multiple crucial concerns on campus and in the country, occupied the administration building for 18 days. Exactly five years later, the hashtag NotAgainSU student protest emerged in response to the administration's lack of response to the newest racial incidents on our campus. Students occupied the newly renovated multi-million dollar Barnes Wellness Center, a highlight on campus tours, for eight days. In both instances, the students point to the university's inability 
and some argue refusal to ensure that all students feel like they belong on campus. Not ironically, in both of the images that you see, student protesters address the campus community and the administration at Hendricks Chapel, some consider the heart of our university campus. What I learned from the students during both movements was their resolve to form community despite feeling unsupported and disregarded by the university. They were firm that they would not be silenced and that their voices would be heard in their own words and on their own terms. They centered their movements figuratively and physically by occupying spaces on campus where they could no longer be ignored. I am also reminded of the power of the youth and new generation in justice movements. Young people are growing up in a time where mass shootings seem the norm and active shooter drills in school are, are routine. They are living during a time when the resurgence of white supremacy and racialized violence is emboldened and given license to thrive. They are witnessing the breaking silences of the Me Too movement and facing the realities of violence toward non-gender conforming and transgender people. They know that anti-black, anti-indigenous, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and anti-Semitic hate is real. Yet, in the face of violent demonstrations of hate, we bear witness to the traditions of justice movements led by indigenous people protecting the water and the land, and movements led by the youth activists reclaiming the climate. So as James Baldwin said in his 1963 A Talk to Teachers, we are living in dangerous times. What then is the role of a community of scholars like LRA in these dangerous times? How do we understand who we are and who we are becoming as a literacy research community? So my definition of community comes from a black feminist way of knowing. This is an image of Harriet Tubman, a black, disabled, and illiterate woman who freed herself and hundreds of enslaved people. She did so despite people telling her she couldn't make the journey on her own or without a man. She did so despite people telling her that she couldn't do it because of her seizures. She did so despite people telling her that she couldn't because she couldn't read. She did not let others define her knowledge, her literacy skills, or her abilities. Her life was exemplary of a black woman's commitment toward community, fighting for a community of her people to be free. My own origin story begins in 1974. I was born into a family defined by love, knowledge, and guidance of black women. My community was black women led and inspired by my mother, my grandmothers, my aunties, and my sister cousins. I learned and understood my black girl and womanhood from my everyday experiences being in and with black girls and women at church, on the block and on the playground, at the beauty salon and in my mother's kitchen, where it was often best as a young child to be seen and not heard. Yet, in the company of black women, I felt safe, I felt cared for, and I felt loved. 1974 is also an important year historically for black feminist movements. In 1974, black and queer feminist activists formed the Kambahi River Collective, defining themselves by and for themselves. They wrote, the most general statement of our politics at present time would be that we are actively committed to struggling against racial sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and see as our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. As black women, we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous oppressions that women of, of color face. They formed out of necessity as the mainstream feminist movements failed to address issues of race. The name of the collective references the 1853 raid 
that Harriet Tubman led on the Combahee River that freed over 750 people who were enslaved. They chose Combahee because it was important for them to name themselves after an action as opposed to a person. They named themselves for a political action for liberation, a declaration that represented their reclaiming of black women's history of community and activism. I have been blessed to help form and participate in many black women and girl-centered communities, including Dark Girls Syracuse, the Black Girls Literacies Collective, Soulful Saturday Sisters Book Club, and the Sankofa Doula Collective. What I have learned from these black feminist communities is the importance of and need to create spaces to share our stories. I've experienced the desire for connectedness, for collective healing and renewal, centering our health and our wellness. These spaces have taught me about the importance of service and activism, our kitchen table talks, our sister circles, our collective, our literary, literary clubs, these represent black women's ways of forming and sustaining community. We write statements and manifestos as a rhetorical strategy to define who we are and what we believe as a black feminist community. We name ourselves for ourselves, by ourselves. And I also know very real the challenges for sustaining such communities and the need to acknowledge areas for growth and evolution particularly to maintain relevancy and purpose for new generations. I want to also pause to note that the image on the left is also by Dr. Grace Player, a beautiful image. So my framework for understanding and defining discourses is informed first by a black feminist standpoint, so shout out to Patricia Hill Collins, and is imbued with scholarship from black women language and literacy scholars like Geneva Smitherman, Elaine Richardson, Arnitha Ball, Carol Lee, and Carmen Kennard, as well as new voices like April Baker Bell, Bonnie Faria Williams, and Latoya Sawyer. Foucault defines discourses as ways of constituting knowledge, together with the social practices, forms of subjectivity, and power relations which inhere in such knowledges and relations between them. Fairclaw defines discourse through a lens of language as a social practice and underscores the relationship between language power and ideologies. G distinguishes between small d, big D discourses, ascribing a capital D to emphasize that language choice is motivated by our need to play the right social role and convey the right values, beliefs, and attitudes in particular context. But my black feminist standpoint directs me first to the activism of Sojourner Truth, to the hip hop feminism of Lauryn Hill, to a pop culture reference that exposes my steady diet of reality TV, including Nene Leakes of Real Housewives of Atlanta. But herein lies the theoretical dexterity of black women's ways of producing knowledge. We understand that words are understood in context, historically, contemporaneously, and metaphorically, and we can convey that understanding in a multitude of ways. We be knowing, like comedian and actress Amanda Seal says, and our words and our stories matter and are deemed sources of legitimate knowledge. This knowledge does not exist because Foucault, Fairclaw, or G says so. No diss to them, but I'm just saying. So for the rest of this talk, I turn now to my reflection on discourse of four communities. The literacy community, the teacher community, the research community, and the professional community. Those discourses are diversity, inclusion, justice, and belonging terms and concepts that often circulate within and beyond literacy research and practice, and often without critical interrogation for their historical context and the material consequences of their use. 
So I'm sure many of you saw the title of my talk, and you probably said, oh, that's going to be the TV drama, This Is Us. Well, I can certainly make connections there. But actually, in March 2019, just about the time that I started thinking about the subject for this talk, the movie Us came out in theaters. I love horror stories. Horror is one of my favorite genres of text, including my love of a Stephen King novel, to my memories growing up watching Psycho, Friday the 13th, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> I can only express sheer delight at the emerging body of horror films by filmmaker Jordan Peele. I use images and references to the movie Us to frame my discussion of discourses of community. Of course, there will be no real spoilers, but if you haven't seen this film, please do. But just so that we all have a basic abstract of this film, here is the two-minute trailer. Now let me caution you, I don't see any small ones in the room, but this is not for small children. That's a classic right there. What does I Got Five want it mean? It's about drugs. It's not about drugs. It's a dope song. Don't do drugs. Get in rhythm. There you go. There you go. Creep on in, on in, on can't believe how big Dave got. Did you hear Gabe got a boat? <laughs> He's kidding, right? He's not kidding. Hey, I think it's vodka clock. Oh, yeah. Where's Jason? Jason? Jason! Where were you? I didn't know if you were lost. Stick with me, and I'll keep you safe. I got <laughs> There's a family in our driveway. It's probably the neighbors. But y'all scared of a family? Hi, can I help you? Zora, put your shoes on. If you want to get crazy, we can get crazy. Exactly like us. They think like us. They know where we are. We need to move and keep moving. They won't stop until they kill us. Or we kill them. That was, that was good. I wish I had a camera. Okay. <clears throat> so the tethered are a class of people who live below the surface, and each one of them is an identical mirror to someone who lives above the surface, two bodies sharing a single soul. The film offers an opportunity for an analysis of social relations. An underlying message is that if we don't reckon with our past, it will surely haunt us. In the film, the tethered have come back for this reckoning. <laughs> so let's talk about discourses of inclusion. The movie begins with a young Adelaide having an encounter with her tethered self. She is forever changed, and her parents worry about her silence and her withdrawal. So the family therapist advises them to encourage her to draw to write, to dance, anything to get her to tell her story. The theory of the tether is metaphorical for the real lived experiences 
of members of society who are the forgotten and ignored, whose lives seem to not matter. I am reminded of author Jessamyn Ward, who writes for the children never allowed to be children, the throwaway kids, as referenced here in an excerpt from the documentary on the Atlanta child murders. In Jessamyn Ward's 2017 essay, Raising a Black Son in the U.S., of giving birth to her black son, she writes, my son had never taken a breath and I was already mourning him. There are countless stories of young people's lives disrupted or ended. Ava DuVernay's series, When They See Us, let us hear the stories of the exonerated five, narratives necessary to challenge the constant dominant discourse and mistelling of their lived experiences. Recently, Tamir Rice's mother, Samiria Rice, created a safety handbook with the ACLU to help guide young people in their interactions with the police. She did this in honor of her son's life. It is an eight-page online guide, includes sections on what to do if the police stop you, if they ask you questions, they want to search you or begin arresting you. This informational text is designed for a particular audience of young people who commu whose communities have historically faced violent interactions with the police state. There is a growing body of research on the experiences of black girls in school violence. Black girls are 16% of the female student population, but nearly one-third of all girls refer to law enforcement and more than one-third of all female school-based arrests. The criminalization of black girls is much more than a street phenomenon. It has extended into our schools, disrupting one of the most important protective factors in a girl's life, her education. What happens to the children who are excluded, thrown away, forgotten? Who can be children? Whose lives matter? And Sister Outsider Audre Lorde writes, our children cannot dream unless they live, they cannot live unless they are nourished, and who else will feed them the real food without which their dreams will be no different from ours? If you want us to change the world someday, we at least have to live long enough to grow up, shouts the child. James Baldwin wrote, these are all our children. We will profit by or pay for whatever they become. And as Toni Morrison wrote in God Help the Child, what you do to children matters and they might never forget. In 2016, LRA released a statement on racial violence that reads, children and youth in our schools today are living in a time of heightened racial violence. And these are the contexts in which literacy research examines issues that affect literacy learning and achievement. Historically, literacy research has played a role in promoting and sustaining, as well as interrupting deficit-centered narratives about the literacy practices of people of color. Liter LRA stands poised to address issues of oppression against black and brown youth that begin within classrooms where certain ways of doing language and literacy aligned with and representative of white middle class norms invalidates the literacy practices of black, of black and brown youth in schools. We will raise the visibility of anti-racist scholarship, particularly research that might shape more equitable educational practices for children and youth of color. These kids can't read, they can't write. This is a phrase that I have heard many times. Who does the they refer to? Who is making the assertion and why? How are they defining reading and writing? What are they presupposing about these kids and as opposed to other kids? What happens to the children who are defined by these deficit discourses? We might begin by changing our inquiries from a place that can position learners in deficit ways. Questions might be, how do we engage children in reading and writing? How do we get kids to read and write? Or better yet, why aren't kids reading and writing? We might change those inquiries to a stance of presuming their competence. How do we support their reading and writing? And how do we protect and serve their interests in reading and writing? The language that we use to frame the inquiries assumes who we deem teachable, who we are including and excluding, and our definitions of what it means to be literate. 
And when we consider curriculum, whose stories matter? Which texts are included and centered in the classroom? Who gets to tell the stories? Who gets to be the readers and writers? I have been fortunate for the past 10 years now to lead a project in Syracuse, Writing Our Lives, that has introduced me to some talented young writers, artists, and activists. And over the 10 years, I've captured countless examples of the ways that young people's identities and read of readers and writers are challenged by school-sanctioned definitions of who gets to be literate. This is an image of Jocelyn a young person who has participated in the Writing Our Lives youth writing community, and we've actually had the occasion to publish a piece together. This poem that she wrote speaks to the power of voice and for the silenced. To speak in silence. To speak in silence is a scary thing, especially when you don't even know your own voice. Once you've found your voice, how do you speak? What do you say? Where do you start? You speak your truth. You sing it as if you're performing the most beautiful song. It oozes off of your lips like honey on the freshest comb. You proclaim it as loud as you need to. You scream to the mountaintops, and it is amazing to hear your voice. And once you hear it, it's quite hard to go back to the cold silence. I've been in silence, and then I found my voice. And now I can't be quiet. So how do you speak in silence? You speak unapologetically. You speak proudly. You speak boldly. You speak triumphantly. And finally, you break the silence. So we love that word, diversity. In the article, Language of Appeasement, higher education scholar Dafina Lazarus Stewart argues that by substituting diversity and inclusion rhetoric for transformative efforts to promote equity and justice, colleges avoid recognizable institutional change. So she provides a model for understanding the affordances and limitations of diversity and inclusion as opposed to equity and justice. For example, she offers diversity she offers that diversity asks who's in the room when equity responds, who is trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? Diversity asks how many more of blank group do we have this year than last? When equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as the perpetual majority here? So I use this image of the bunnies, a symbol used throughout the film to segue into this discussion of diversity. The bunnies in the movie are the food for the tether. They multiply to be sacrificed. There are constant calls for increases in diversity in our institutions and organizations, but to what end? for whom and for what purpose. Don't you love that music? That's a jam. We need more diverse teachers. So teacher education is certainly a topic of study by many in the field of literacy research. Research on literacy teacher education has been concerned with how do we prepare literacy teachers to meet the needs of students who have been historically marginalized. Some of the challenges that we face include increasing the diversity of teacher candidates, offering more and higher quality literacy courses to meet the increasing de definitions of literacy and reduced enrollment. As more and more initiatives to increase teacher diversity are launched, we have a continued agenda to understand the experiences of current teachers and pre-service teachers of color. Research studies into why and how teachers of color come to teaching and what pulls them away can and will greatly inform these initiatives. So across my career, I have remained interested in the connection between literacy research, racial and linguistic diversity, and teacher education. And in my mind, there is a parallel relationship between advocating for literacy classrooms with diverse racial and linguistic representation in curriculum and instruction and addressing the needs for more teachers. However, 
There is a danger in bringing in people of color without changing oppressive structures. As my research has explored, teacher education then becomes a site of racial violence. So when we say we need more diverse teachers, how are we defining diverse? And toward what end do we need these teachers? This definition of diversity by Dene activist poet Lila June says it well. There must be deliberate actions for decolonizing teaching and teacher education. While efforts to increase teacher diversity are needed, they are counterproductive to any real systemic change when one, they do not require anything different of the predominantly white teacher force. Two, when the programs do not require changes to the curriculum or the approaches to teaching. Increasing the numbers of teachers of color will not incite change if they are yet bound to the same curriculum and pedagogy that has not served the student population well. Three, they do not include a plan to restructure leadership or positions of power. They fail to draw on teachers as a source of power or to encourage a shared leadership model. Four, they put the onus for academic achievement on teachers of color, in essence, setting them up for failure. When the programs fail, the blame can be put on the teachers of color. Such programs will go awry if teachers of color are still positioned on the margins, in the fringes, and on the periphery. And five, the programs emphasize increasing diversity in number only. The numbers of teachers of color increase, but there is no intentional shift to engage culturally relevant and anti-racist pedagogies or a mission to cultivate a more racially and economically just society. To that end, we must also ask, what does it mean to be teachers and educators in the reawakening of racial violence? What does it mean to teach as if black lives matter? What does it mean to teach in ways that directly challenges deficit narratives, excluding certain learners? Ibram Kendi offers in his latest book a framework for being anti-racist. His argument sets out that there is no room for neutrality in this struggle. There is no in-between safe spaces of being not racist. That means that the opposite of racist is not not racist. The opposite of racist is anti-racist. So if you're not actively anti-racist, you're racist. We must begin to think about teaching anti-racist methods and pedagogies in literacy teacher education. There is no room for preparing teachers without a deliberate analysis of race and racism. I recall past President Arlette Willis's 2014 presidential address where she asked, why have discussions of, why have discussions of race at a literacy conference? Why discuss race and literacy? Why not discuss race openly? These might have been considered bold assertions five years ago. How will we answer these same questions today? In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Jordan Peele revealed, I think rabbits and scissors, they're both scary things to me, both inane things. So I love subverting and bringing out the scariness in the things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with that. The scissors are an everyday object used as a weapon by the tethered as they come above ground for the reckoning, a kind of justice. The tethered had a purpose, a desired outcome and impact. The movie makes the assertion that we should sever ourselves from the worst of what's in us. And that requires the sharpest of tools, our research methods. So what counts as research? We can interrupt colonial discourse and literacy research that privileges particular ways of knowing and doing while marginalizing others. Community-engaged practices of literacy research honor the knowledges and intellectual traditions of and in communities. They elevate often marginalized groups to knowers and acknowledge multiple ways of knowing and doing. Personal experiences, for example, can become a method of knowledge production used to analyze and dismantle levels of systemic racism. In her 2019 TED Talk, What Reading Slowly Taught Me About Writing, 
Author Jacqueline Woodson describes a myriad methods of knowledge production she observed and learned from black traditions of storytelling. But here is the story within that story. Those who left and those who stayed carried with them the history of a narrative, knew deeply that writing it down wasn't the only way they could hold on to it, knew they could sit on their porches or their stoops at the end of a long day and spin a slow tale for their children. They knew they could sing their stories through the thick heat of picking cotton and harvesting tobacco, knew they could preach their stories and sew them into quilts, turn the most painful ones into something laughable, and through that laughter, exhale the history of a country that tried again and again and again to steal their bodies, their spirit, and their story. In their editorial of the special issue of Journal of Literacy Research, Star Fellows Lamar Johnson, Theda Gibbs Gray, and April Baker Bell pose the question, what does it mean to be a literacy researcher of color in our current racial and political context? They ask the same questions. What counts as data? What counts as analytical methods? What counts as theory? What counts as research? They discuss the ways that northern notions of conducting and writing research have colonized and continue to neo-colonize people globally. In past President Rebecca Rogers' 2017 presidential address, she laid out for us how literacy research has an entangled history with racial justice. She argued that literacy research is white property. She broke down how research rep reproduces power relations. She argued for equitable flows of knowledge versus segregated flows. This work begins by considering who gets cited and who we teach our doctoral students to cite and the next generation of scholars to cite. Somehow doing research about community or identity or people and communities of color is not viewed as legitimate. Expecting those of us who do this kind of work to also demonstrate theoretical and methodological dexterity. Gloria Lassen Billings has said, scholars of color have the potential to blaze new epistemological trails, lifting up new generations. And yes, they do. They have the potential, but they are blazing new pathways in the field of literacy research. It is imperative that we understand the genealogies of our research agendas, what informs the work that we do, the methods that we use, what is the story of our research trajectory, can you trace the genealogy, why do you use certain tools. In my own work, I regularly teach a doctoral seminar on discourse analysis. And I have to be intentional about introducing my students to theory and research that does not perpetuate white dominance and superiority. This is what happens when syllabi center and lead back to white and often male theorists and researchers. I think this clip from Toni Morrison says it best. Just ignore Charlie Rose. <laughs> a lawyer thing. once asked you the question, can you imagine writing a novel that's not centered about race? And you said, absolutely. Yes. Will you? That's what he asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, see, I answered the question he didn't pose. You know, um, Tolstoy writes about race. Yeah. All the time. Um, so does Zola. So does James Joyce. Now, if anybody can go up to an imaginary James Joyce and say, you write about race all the time. It's central in your novels. When are you gonna write about what? Because you see, the person who asks that question doesn't understand that he is also, he or she is also race. So to ask me when am I gonna stop, and or when, if I can, is to ask a question that, in a, in a sense, is its own answer. Yes, I can write about white people. White people can write about black people. Anything can happen in art. There are no boundaries there. Having to do it or having to prove that I can do it is what was embarrassing or insulting. In this book, I did. It was insulting that people, help me understand, what was insulting? The, the idea that you felt like you had to prove that you could write 
he po- yeah, the question was posed as though it were a desirable thing to do, right. to write about white people or to write not about race. That's what that means to right. me. Um, and that it was a difficult thing to do, a higher level of artistic endeavor, or it was more important, uh, and that I was still writing about marginal people, and why don't I come into the mainstream? Yeah, aren't you importing too much into the question? Maybe. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what could else could it be, Charlie? What what does that mean? What does that question mean? You tell me if I'm making too much. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That- well, yeah, he don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I was trained to read and cite white and often male theorists and researchers. And I had to demonstrate understanding of that knowledge in order to earn my degree. I had to know the master's language, a form of double consciousness. But we all know that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So not no more. I seek out those methodologies, black feminists, indigenous, decolonizing, racial justice focused, critical race, queer, and humanizing methodologies that center the histories, genealogies, knowledges, and literacies rooted within communities. I would argue that we have to expand beyond the dominant tools and methods that have historically been used within literacy research if we intend to address broader issues impacting the children and communities we purport to serve. But when you do work that is community engaged or that is grounded in cultural traditions, you are expected to demonstrate what folks consider legitimate knowledge. Because I know that some people will leave this talk and still say, well, that wasn't about literacy research. Or what did that have to do with literacy research? At last year's conference, we invited a session titled, This is America, The Role of Literacy Research in These Precarious Times. The session brought together chairs from standing committees on ethics, research, policy, and legislative and ethnicity, race, and multilingualism to engage in dialogue around the role of literacy research within the current socio-political climate. The room was packed, as many of you may recall. We had an open and honest conversation addressing the questions about the role of literacy researchers and how our inquiries and methods can respond to current times. We talked about how we measure and value impact. We work to qualify what we mean when we say literacy research matters. We must continually challenge ourselves to know why we conduct research, for whom, and to what end. Hands Across America was a public event on Sunday, May 25, 1986, in which approximately 6.5 million people held hands for 15 minutes in an attempt to form a continuous human chain across the United States. There are several references to this event in the film. Red admits that her plan to bring the tether to the surface included a big symbolic act, which is how us ends with a long haunting image of thousands of red outfitted members of the tethered holding hands across a mountain range. It brings new symbolism to Hands Across America, an event originally intended to raise awareness about homelessness and hunger across the world. In the final shot of us, it could be argued that Jordan Peele reframes the awareness campaign to show that Americans often ignore social ills that exist. What I saw in the film was a desire for belonging, for connectedness. I don't feel like I belong anymore. There is a personalization in this statement. It has different meaning depending on the speaker and on the audience. Because of the emphasis on anymore, one might infer why the person felt they belonged before. Anymore suggests a past feeling of before. I've heard this phrase several times in reference to LRA. What was it about the LRA of the past that made you feel like you belonged? What has changed that you no longer feel that way? I started attending LRA 10 years ago. I came because of the STAR mentoring program I am a member of the program's first cohort. Upon attending my first LRA, I said in my blackly way, this space is white. 
It felt like there were a handful of us folks of color who were attending. I think it can be safely argued that the STAR program has helped to increase diverse representation of scholars of color over the past 10 years. Not just because of those who are or were a part of the program, but also because of the ways we've encouraged our colleagues and friends to come to our LRA. But how do you assess the effectiveness or success of a program like STAR? Do you mark success by the increase in the number of scholars that are now members? Do you mark success based on the professional accomplishments of those who participated? Mentoring programs often emphasize the individual scholar. They focus on the individual needs to be apprenticed and supported so that they can succeed in the current organizational structure. While the onus is placed put on the success and engagement of the scholar of color, what then of the rest of the organization? How does LRA change? In breaking down the dangers of what happens when organizational structures, systems, and practices do not change and the diverse scholars leave, Dr. Carmen Kennard writes, institutions pick up and go along as if we were never there but they do so at the grave risk of repeating past mistakes and they truly, and they never truly move forward. And as Ibram Kendi writes, denial is the heartbeat of racism, beating across ideologies, races, and nations. It is beating within us. It cannot be that the scholars of color come to LRA through programs like STAR to be viewed and treated as a charity project the organization's form of missionary work. The same can be said for doctoral students, international scholars, and other marginalized members of the LRA community. All of this is connected. Who we view as literate and whose literacies are cultivated in schools and communities, who we recruit and retain as literacy teachers, who we mentor and support through our PhD programs, who we hire for tenure track positions in our literacy education programs, who we appoint to committees, who we nominate for leadership positions and the processes we use for those nominations, and who we elect. We reproduce power relations. We maintain systems and structures. We create conditions that maintain certain groups as a perpetual majority. Inclusion asks, is this, the environment, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? Justice challenges whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views. So this is who we say we are. In our mission, we say we are a community of scholars. We say that we mentor and support future generations of literacy scholars. Words matter. Every year at the conference, we have the town hall session, one of the ways we gather as a community. We use the town hall as a discursive metaphor. Town hall meetings were spaces where members gathered for democratic rule in a particular geopolitical space that was stolen, settled, and colonized. Such spaces often excluded women, indigenous people, and people of color. Literacy scholars Stephanie Tolliver, Stephanie Jones, Lara Jimenez, Grace Player, Joseph Rumanap, and Joaquin Munoz in their 2019 LRTMP article offer a way of reimagining how we gather as an organization, abandoning our engagement with settler colonialism and identifying metaphors for the decolonization of this community. We do not have to maintain systems and structures because that's just the way it's always been done. Besides, who is the we and who do we want to, the community to be? I joined the LRA community because I wanted to work in solidarity with individuals who are committed to literacy research that is relevant, transformative, and life-changing. I truly believe that without community, there is no liberation. But community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. And as for increasing diversity and working within community, if you have come to help me, 
you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. What will it mean to invite people into this community? What then is the role of a community of scholars like LRA in these times? How do we understand who we are and who we are becoming as a literacy research community? I think the organization has to wrestle with what community means and how this understanding has and must evolve with new generations of literacy scholars. It is a sort of reckoning. Our present is inextricably connected to the past. The past still haunts us, and it demands of us in the present a reckoning with sickness that will continue to fester. This is not easy work, and it requires facing our differences as well as our pain. What if literacy research was a way toward collective healing and justice? If I've learned nothing else from the student protesters and youth leading the justice movements of today, they are calling for action that responds to the real issues they are facing now in the present and that lurk in the near future. They want to sustain the planet. And they are saying that time is up. Racial violence is a literacy research issue. Border separation is a literacy research issue. White rage, white fragility, white supremacy are all literacy research issues. I am inspired by the new generation of literacy scholars acknowledging the past, yet blazing new pathways for the future. They are carrying their folding chairs because they are no longer waiting on those occupying seats at the table to make change. They are building their own tables. Hey, come on, come out, wherever you are. We need to have this meeting at this tree ain't even been planted yet. Thank you.